Portfolio Composer, episode 163. You're listening to the Portfolio Composer podcast with your host and coach, Garrett Hope, where he teaches you what it takes to master the business end of writing music through mindset, marketing, and business skills. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter at theportfoliocomposer.com for exclusive offers, business insights, and information not shared on the podcast. And now for this episode of The Portfolio Composer. Secret ingredient is anything in the pancakes. The secret ingredient is who you're cooking them for. And to me, that is the, that is the, the core of the book right there. And I think that's, that's like, that's so music also. I mean, it, it's, the point of music is, is that it lands in the ear of the listener, right? Isn't it? It's like what it, what, what it creates in, in the heart and soul of, of the, of the people that hear it. Um, and so that's, same thing with the chef. It's the same thing with a business person, honestly. You can create this profitable business, but what's your impact on the world? Who, who, what, how are you changing people's lives or how are you affecting their lives? What's your footprint? What's, your, what's, what's the point, you know? Hello and welcome to the Portfolio Composer. My name is Garrett Hope and I am your host and I'm so glad that you're spending your time with us today. If you're already listening to this podcast and you're taking the idea that you are a business owner seriously, you are well on the way to getting the success and building the business you want to have as a composer. And this podcast exists to help us answer the question, what does it mean to be a composer in the 21st century? You've heard it say me say it before, and I'm going to say it again. I believe strongly that we as composers are small business owners, and we can learn a lot about how to move forward in the world, present our music, and impact the lives of those who listen to and perform our music if we begin to think like business owners. And that's what this podcast is out to do. Many, many months ago, I got the opportunity to interview John David Mann in episode 118, and we dug into a series of books that he's written that are among my personal favorite books of all time, the Go-Giver series. And in those series, John and his co-author, Bob Berg, really teach us what it means to provide value and what value really means and money. And we are compensated based on the value we then provide to the world. Well, John recently reached out to me and said, hey, I'm publishing a new book. I would love to... I would love for you to read it. And I did, and I, I loved it, and I'm happy to invite John back onto the show. So welcome, John. Oh, so great to be here. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, I'm really happy to speak with you again. John David Mann is best known for his award-winning business parable, The Go-Giver, written with business thought leader Bob Berg and his New York Times best-selling military memoir, The Red Circle, with former Navy SEAL sniper Brandon Webb. John doesn't publish books, he writes them. Someone else publishes and markets them. But when more than 40 publishers passed on his latest manuscript, he was faced with two choices, shelve it or take it on himself. The recipe is a tale of heartbreak and redemption, a meditation on great food and secrets of the kitchen and a life manual, all wrapped together into a story that is being called an instant classic by George Foreman, a timeless fable with guidelines for living that will last a lifetime by Daniel Pink, and the feel-good book of the year, by James Justice. John, I'm so excited to speak with you about this book. Uh, what are, what, what's really exciting you about the content of this book and getting this message out into the world? Well, first of all, I got to say, what's exciting for me about being here and talking with you is that I love talking with other composers, and I hardly ever get to do it. It's yeah. Just, you know, it's like, that's why, those of you who don't know, that's, that was my calling. That's how I started out in life as a composer. And so, you know, I'm not, that's not what I do professionally now, but man, it's like, it's like who I really am under the hood. So it's, it's, it's really, it's great to be here. I love, I love talking with you and your people. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm excited about this book because I, I think that we're doing something that, you know, it's probably been, probably been done in some way, shape or form before, because there's nothing original under the sun, they say, but it, it certainly isn't, you know, it isn't commonly done. And that is the conjunction of personal growth and leadership over here with great food and great cooking. It's kind of like the book is like the karate kid meets master chef, you know, so <laughs> and that, that was a blast to do. Oh, I love it. That's a really great analogy. The karate kid plus master chef. Yeah. 
So one of the things that really interests me, because as you know, many composers are self-published and the burden of getting our music out in the world is really our own. And you have taken on this burden for yourself. You've had bu- bu- many, many books published successfully with traditional publishers, and yet this one was passed up on, and now yeah. you're doing it. So why did these publishers pass up the book, and why did you decide to just do it yourself? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, it was a surprise. <laughs> I will say this. Um, you know, I, I, I've been an entrepreneur in the past, um, before I, I sort of entered on a career as, a, as an author, so I, I'm I'm not a stranger to you know to to the, the the entrepreneur's mantra, which is is if if it's to be, it's up to me. I mean, an entrepreneur is fundamentally a person who generates things, you know, a self self generating uh, performer. And as you as you uh, rightly point out, you know, composers tend to be that by definition. Interestingly enough, authors also are by definition. Even those who are published by New York, and and even those who are published handsomely, I mean, even even authors, with, you know, with with big names and 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 broad followings, uh, and you know, multiple ten thousand book first printings, you know, fifty thousand, hundred thousand book printings, still the burden of promotion and marketing of the book tends to rest on on the uh, on the author, and a lot of people, you know, who who aren't in the business of publishing books, you know, don't realize that they, they, they have this idea that, you know, you're, if you're a famous writer, you, you write the book and then the publisher just handles it from there. I have, and that's not the way it is. It doesn't work that way. Uh, that, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. That's a hundred percent true for music too. There's yeah, this kind yeah. of myth that if you get on with a major publishing house, Boozy and Hawks, right. Hal Leonard, Alfred, right. anybody, that they're going to get your music out. If you if you are a bestseller out of the gate, then they'll promote you. Otherwise, you're on your own. Yes, yes, yeah, it's so true. And you know, for me, I developed, and we probably talked about this in our last show, one eighteen. I, I developed a business model for myself that's worked really well, which is I partner up with uh, another person. Uh, you mentioned Bob Berg, the Go Giver Books, Brandon Webb, the Navy Seal, and we've done five books together. And and I've partnered with other people in in books where. I supply the main writing muscle. I do the heavy lifting on the writing side, and they uh, they do the the public face of the book. You know, they get it out there. They they do the travel. They do the roadshow. They have the the social media outreach. They have the what you know whatever. They have the platform to get it out there. Worked really well for me um, until now. <laughs> <laughs> until it didn't. Um, you know, it, it's uh, I, I don't have. Uh, uh, a, a huge social media platform. You know, I don't have 50,000, 100,000 Twitter followers or Facebook. You know, I, I don't have, you know, that kind of, like I send out a newsletter to, to you know, I send out a newsletter to about 1,000 people, an email newsletter a couple times a year. And, and the statistics of my, of my website tell me that, you know, yeah, 40% of them actually open it and read it. So <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I, don't, right. I don't have, I don't have a, I can't just snap my fingers and sell a book in other words. So that's why taking this on was was so different, was such a left turn. Um, and, and so you asked, why did they turn it down? Yeah. First of all, it was a surprise. Uh, here I am, like 24 books or so, you know, a couple dozen books in the market, New York Times bestsellers, 2 million copies sold, blah, blah, blah. If I believed my own press, I would assume that I could just snap my fingers and get a book published, which I kind of thought, I, I, I admit, <laughs> I kind of thought, you know, this is going to be a no-brainer. I, I wrote the book. And I, I I loved the book. I mean, writing it was just a, a. These are the kinds of books. I mean, I've written monster huge books. Uh, I, we published a book earlier this year called The Killing School. That like is like one hundred and thirty thousand words or something. Huge oh, book. It took a year to write practically. And but these books, like The Go Giver, and like this one, The Recipe. This is the kind of book I love to write. Like if I were a composer, I probably would have been Ravel or something. It's like. These little miniatures, you know, they're kind of like these little stories that aren't that are easy to read in a in a in a night or two. Um, that even people who don't normally read, uh, you know, have no problem reading this. It's, they're simple, they're easy, but they have a message and they have some feeling to them. And the characters are very real, you know. They're not simplistic, they're not two dimensional, but they're mm. but they're little, they're little, they're like you know, it's like reading The Alchemist or Life of Pi or something like this. They're fables. So. My agent read it and said, oh, my God, best thing you ever did, best writing you've ever done. We're going to take this to New York. We're going to slay. There's going to be an auction. 
They're going to vie for the, you know, for, for the, the rights. We're going to drive the price up. You're going to get a, a seven-figure advance. Yeah, none of those things happened. Oh, no. <laughs> so she took it to New York. And the editors uh, in New York, because, you know, when you take a, a book to a, a manuscript to a publishing company, it's the editor who, who reads it, not the publisher. The editors read it, and they said things like, oh, my God, I love this. this I love this book. The 14-year-old boy and the crusty old chef, I love these characters. Um, the life lessons are profound. The, the, the descriptions of cooking are just mouthwatering and tantalizing. Uh, the storyline is incredibly poignant. There are surprises I didn't see coming. I, I love it. We're going to pass. <laughs> and, and then, you know, when you hear that a dozen times, you, get, you might get discouraged. Well, we heard it 40 times. And I think that the reason that they, I mean, they all gave the reasons, but but some said, you know, we're business publishers, and this is not a business book. Well, the Go Giver is presented as a business book, but it, it isn't really. I mean, it sort of is, but it you know, it's it's kind of more than that. Or, it, but in this case, nobody could quite see where it fit. They said, I'm not sure what shelf it it sits on at Barnes and Noble. I, I don't know mm-hmm. what category it's slotted in on Amazon. And publishers are a risk averse folk. They're like movie producers. So we really had to think about this. I mean, are, are they right? <laughs> Does, is, there, is there no place that this thing fits? Because I'll tell you, Garrett, even though I may love the writing in the book, and I may have fallen in love with the, mm-hmm. the story myself, I'm not so uh, uh, blind as to think that just because the writing is good or just because I like it, it means that the market's going to buy it. It isn't necessarily the case. Sure. Um, so, you know, we had to ask, is there is there a market for this? And we believe that there are a ton of people out there who really love reading about personal growth and leadership and that, that whole sphere, and also are really into good food, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like they, they read, uh, uh, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People or Jonathan Livington Seagull and watch Food Network. Right. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So that's that's our marketplace. The only the only real I mean I I just am convinced that they're out there. The only real question is can Charles and I um, create a machine that 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 reaches those people? And uh, that's that's the big question. And that's you know right now as you and I are speaking, I don't know the answer. We don't know. Uh, we won't know till mid October if if uh, you know how things are how things are looking for that. Sure. Well, anytime you put something out in the world, there is the big unknown. But that's yep. also part of our calling as creative individuals. Yes, it is. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious here. What are all the things that you had to consider when you took on the burden of publishing? I, I could give you a short list of what a composer has to consider, but I want to know from your perspective as an author of traditional books, how do you how do you determine the market, or do you? pay attention to your audience? How do you get things in front of them? What steps are you taking to make this happen? Yeah, yeah. Um, first off, I, I, I do pay, uh, pay huge attention to, to my market. Um, you know, I got into writing, uh, aside from the fact that it was just, you know, something that was there and something I could, I could do and, and make a small living at. But I, I love the, the craft of it. I love words. I've always loved words. I love just the, you know, the, the, the process of it and the, and the finished product of it. But as I've gotten into it, and especially with The Go-Giver, which was 10 years ago, and, and books that followed it, I started getting you know, feedback from the world <laughs> and getting emails and, and, and texts and stuff from, uh, from readers. And there's, I, I have found no greater high than you know, hearing from someone on the other side of the country saying, wow, you know, this book touched my life in this way and that way and so forth. It's just, it's just so fantastic. You know, that honestly, as a composer, that's what I didn't get. I didn't get very far in my career as a composer. I mean, I was like 20 by the time I changed, changed paths. So I never really developed that career. But the thing that, that, that was the hardest for me was I would write music that I loved and, and nobody heard it. It didn't get right. performed. I mean, it did a little bit, but not much. Um, I, I crave that. That to, I'll be honest. I'll crave that. That the the the, the readership, the feedback. I, I want to know that those words are landing on some soil out there. So uh, yeah, I pay a lot of attention, and I think one of the most valuable things that we've that we've done in this process is give the book away, give away content to um, to a sphere of readers, which is is now it's like topping two hundred people have uh, have read the book. Wow. You know, for free. I mean, it's like, it could be as, yeah, it's probably about 200 people have uh, have actually read the book. 
a ton of them have given us feedback. And that just, I think that, you know, for, I, often I'm on podcasts that are, that are for entrepreneurs, you know, business entrepreneurs. And, I'll, and what I say to them is, if you're an entrepreneur, um, one of the first things you want to do is you want to put your product in people's hands, in real users' hands, before you launch your business. Um, you know, I was talking with the founder of BarkBox. They put out a, a monthly mm-hmm. box to dog owners, right? It's a yeah. subscription company. And uh, they have, uh, the way they started was a guy was looking for stuff for his own dog and he created this box and, and uh, a friend of his built a little mock website he put on his phone, you know, to say, what would it be like for this as a business? And he showed it to friends and by, the, by uh, uh, six weeks out, he had like two dozen friends who, were, who had given him their credit cards and said, I want this, you got to start this business. And uh, so he did. And then they got 24, pe- 24 million people today. But the way the business started was not with capital, you know, not with structure, not with a company name, not with anything, but with 24 eager users. So, I, I mean, I think getting your stuff in front of people is, uh, and getting their feedback is just such a, a vital part of the creative and commercial process. Right. Uh, can I dig into that for a second? Yeah. I, I mean, I know this is common wisdom in contemporary business spheres about giving away a lot of our best stuff. Yep. It's a way of providing and adding value, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And as a composer, as a content creator, as someone who puts things out in the world, this can also be scary because this is my intellectual property. And if I just give my music away, then how can I also recoup the cost? And you and many others are finding this balancing act of giving it away, but also saying, hey, if you like this, you can can buy the book. What are your insights into this? And do you have any wisdom that we could apply as composers to how we do that with music? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I can provide good insights on how to do it with music, and I might have to rely on you there. We might have to lean on you a little bit, but I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, for me, I, I had the same thing. It's like, uh, this is my, my baby, my pride and joy, and, and uh, it also, you know, is intended to be what supports my wife and me for the rest of our lives. Right. This, this writing, right? So I need, man, I need, I need to make money on this. I need this to work commercially. So giving stuff away is, is always a very considered act for me. Um, so in this case, for example, I, I, I pulled this model. I pulled it from a, a novelist friend of mine. I, I watched him doing it, and I, d- I decided to do something similar to what he did. I sent out an email to my newsletter list and said, guys, I, I want to give you free access to this book for the next two weeks on one condition. Actually, two conditions. One, uh, but the main condition is I want you to leave a, uh, a review on Amazon the day, the day it launches. Because... What I've discovered is that people pay attention to how many reader reviews there are in a book. It's like if you opened a restaurant, you want the restaurant full on opening night because people walking by look in and say, hey, restaurant's full. You know, this should be a good place. Right. If, if the place is empty, no matter how, how, the good, how good the food is, people go, oh, God, no business. I'm going to steer clear of that place. Same thing with a book on Amazon. If you launch a book and a weekend it's got three reader reviews, then people who, stu- who happen to get referred to it by the referral engine will – will tend to avoid it. Uh, whereas if it has 30 reader reviews, even if some of them are bad reviews, like one-star reviews, still, if there's quantity there, there's people around the water cooler, they'll gather. So I really wanted those reviews. That was worth money to me. So I said to these, my, my guys, my, my list, I said, if you, if you read the book, I'll give it to you for free, but you got to agree to leave a, a review. Knowing full well that if I get 25% of them to actually do it, that'll be great. Right. And that's what we call social proof. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So how did you shortcut the learning process here of uh, learning how to give away free content, um, getting your mind wrapped around everything that needs to go into the publishing? Did you do any steps to teach yourself these things or people you studied or spoke to? Yeah, it's funny because I go, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Nope. Um, So I've been in, in the book business for over a decade, right? But it's kind of shocking how little I, I really knew about the publishing business, um, you know, when you sit down and actually do it. And uh, so I knew that I had to learn a lot. I needed to learn how this business works as a self-publisher, and I needed to learn it fast, and I needed to learn it well. And I also didn't have much time because I'm also writing full-time. So... Um, the first decision I made was that I had, the, oh God, Garrett, I don't know how it is in music, but I know that in, <laughs> in, 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 in books, there's so much 
out there. I mean, if you go into Google and, and you go Google self-publishing books, there's like 10,000 books telling you how to self-publish and promote your book. Um, and you'll go nuts if you try to listen to them all. And what's more, you know, nine out of 10 of those experts don't know what they're talking about. And, and you ha- it's really hard to know which ones are which. So my first, my first strategic move was to figure out who I wanted to listen to. And, and because I knew I was going to have to ignore everybody else. I just don't have time to digest all the information out there. I just don't have time. Right. <clears throat> so I, I, you know, I picked one book. I mean, there, I, I bought two or three, and two of those three are lying unread on my shelf. I, I picked one book. Um, I, I asked for advice from a handful of trusted friends who are, are writers themselves, and spent some time on the internet and sort of look, looked around and, and did my very best due diligence that I could. And I picked one book. It's called Book Launch Blueprint. Brilliant guy, Tim Graw, the track record, very simple approach he has. I picked one consultant that I paid 300 bucks to, best 300 bucks I ever spent. Um, I have one well-published novelist friend. He, when I say friend, it's actually I'm a fan of his and I pestered him enough that he he wrote back to me, and and now he and I correspond, and so I I you know I call him my friend. Mm-hmm. But he's a very successful crime novelist in England, and I learned I watched him, and I learned some tips from him. So I, I have a handful of influences and resources that I could count on the fingers of two hands, and I just I like learned what they did, and I said I'm going to do what they do, and um, I decided where to spend money and where to not spend money. I right away knew that I'm I'm not going to get my books in the airport stores. I'm not going to get my book my book into bookstores. Um, I, I you know I figured out where I could focus on and being and be effective, and where I'd love to focus on if I had a year instead of three months and a fifty thousand dollar budget instead of a three thousand or four thousand dollar budget. And you know, but yep, have to just it's triage, man, just triage. Yeah, guerrilla marketing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you don't have to be in a traditional brick-and-mortar bookstore to sell enough books to get on the New York Times bestseller list anymore. You don't. It was painful for me because, honestly, you know, years ago, I used to have an apartment near a Barnes & Noble, and I was before I the go-giver, and I would literally go over to Barnes & Noble every day to work there in the coffee shop there, and I would go and stand in front of the bookshelves of the category, the, the marketing and the business and the fables and and I would just look at the bookshelves and I would, I would imagine my book there. And, and I did that for like eh, a year, uh, maybe two years, going to Barnes & Noble every chance I got. Every, every time I drove into it, it was in a new town, I'd go to their Barnes & Noble, I'd go look at the bookshelves and watch my book materialize in my mind's eye. And then a couple years later, my books were there on the Barnes & Noble shelves. And I just got such a charge out of it. <laughs> so for me, to, for me to let go of the Barnes & Noble shelves and, and, and be okay with that not being a goal what was um, made perfect sense logistically, but was difficult emotionally. <laughs> right. Like, I'm not going to get that. Uh, so, but yeah, it's, uh, y- you had to make decisions about what was practical and, and, and what wasn't. Mm-hmm. What was one of the biggest lessons that you've learned in this process, John? Oh, God, you know, it's funny that, that, um, so I was talking about that readers group, mm-hmm. you know, my, 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 uh, th- there were actually two conditions. One was leave a reader review. And the other was, um, write me after you read the book and tell me what your favorite passages in the book were your favorite quotes, because the idea was to mine this little sphere of readers for the best quotes in the book and to use those quotes to make some pre-made social media, uh, uh, you know, posts and tweets that I could, I could give people to promote the book. Like, what are your favorite quotes? Well, those would probably be everybody's favorite quotes. So this was the plan. The whole idea was to get them to read the book just so they would give me their quotes and leave a review on Amazon. What I didn't count on and didn't expect was it's like this group just blew up. It turned into like a little community. Um, some people started a, a Facebook discussion group. Um, some invited their, their, like their parents and their kids and their siblings to, to join the readers group and it, it generated this buzz around the book that you couldn't buy for for twenty five thousand um, so, I mean, dollars. It, it it turned out to be a much more valuable tactic 
than than I even imagined that it, that it would be. Not for the Amazon reviews and the quotes, but just for the buzz and the energy and the enthusiasm. So now when I go and I post something on, on Facebook or, or Twitter about the book, I automatically get like a dozen people hitting on it or two dozen or three dozen saying, oh yeah, buy this great book. I read it, it was great, blah, 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 blah. There's an automatic buzz already building that I didn't have to spend a penny on. Yeah. I wonder if we as composers could do the same thing with- I wonder about that too. You know, whether it's an album release or even just a new mm-hmm. score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's what I wonder, and I've never thought about this, but you know, with a fortunately with a book like like a Go Giver style book, and the, the recipe is is a little more novelistic than the Go Giver. It's a little longer. It's you know the description, a little more description. It's a little bit uh, less simple, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what that means is it's not as quite as easy to to pull uh, a billion quotable lines out of the Go Giver. Is just like wall to wall aphorisms practically. It's very quotable. Yeah, but. But still, there's a lot of there's, we pulled a lot of good quotes. You know, to put 24 words or you know 120 characters out and have that represent the whole book is is a, is an interesting thing. I wonder if you can do that with music. I wonder if you can pull in 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 15 seconds of a full throated composition that you know are, are only a tiny peephole. But are intriguing enough huh. to uh, you know to have that same function a soundbite basically. Yeah, it's like the iTunes preview, right? You get this thirty yeah. second. But yeah. but what do you choose? Is it is it? I mean, if we're uh, talking uh, classical uh, uh, composition, you've got your yeah. primary theme, your secondary theme. Uh, I, I know, I know, I know. Oh, well, it's that's more hard. like a novel. I mean, you look at a novel, at a real literary novel. You know, you try to break John Irving or, or something down <laughs> into, into a you know into a thirty five word quote. That's not easy. So, so I, I hear you. It's it's challenging, but I, I still you know, it's it's an interesting idea. If I were uh, composing actively right now and meaning to do that commercially, I would look at that. I would say, how can I apply this model somehow in the to the compositional sphere? Yeah. yeah. Well, let's t- spend some time talking about the book itself, which I really enjoyed, John. It was a pleasure uh-huh. to read. I got a lot out of it. And I actually almost mm-hmm. immediately began applying some of those lessons into my own kitchen, All right. whether my family knew it or not. But the story is called The Recipe. And the MacGuffin here is about a young man who's learning these life skills. But it's so much more than that. I know you just talked about the difficulty of encapsulating a book, but how would you encapsulate it? Yeah. So, well, yeah, I, there's se- there'd be several ways to answer that. Um, you know, there are these, in the, as the book unfolds, is this boy's just lost his dad and he's in a bad place. His life is kind of spiraling down the drain and he's in trouble. His, this crusty old chef that he goes to work for to pay him back for some, some vandalism he committed uh, is teaching him basically how to cook. And so there, there emerge out of the fabric of the story these seven rules of the kitchen. And as you said, it, you know, it, it proves that over time that they're really also seven rules for living. And they form the chef's recipe for, for living a, a life of purpose, a fulfilled life, a great life. Um, but, you know, but, but they are. They're, they're exemplified in the kitchen because, you know, there's that, that, that beautiful Buddhist, Buddhist expression, how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm-hmm. So the attention to detail in the uh, in the kitchen, it took detail in cutting, detail in tasting, detail in mixing. I'll, I'll say this: the first, uh, in, in this is this is a long winded answer to you, to your simple question. So forgive me. Um, in any book I write, I've discovered that there is usually a moment, a first, uh, either it's a first para- it's a paragraph or a sentence or or a scene that I write, which is where the book kind of comes to life for me. And usually it's some place that ends up in the first chapter of the book, but not always. Sometimes it's something that comes late in the book. There's always this, this spark. And I, the same thing happened in composition. I remember it vividly. There'd be this initial theme or motif or not even a, a theme or motif, but just like a, a sound mass or a, a sound concept that would just be like the spark that, that, that sets the story in motion. For me, in the recipe, it was a scene that happens in chapter one. The boy is first in the diner, and the chef sits him down. And the boy is kind of surly and angry, and the chef has basically been put him to the test, which he is not happy about. Like, let's see if you qualify to work at my diner. And so he sits him down in front of a hot dog and a Coke. 
and the kid says, a hot dog and a Coke, that's the big culinary test? Like, <laughs> you know, what kind of like jerk is this? And uh, the, the chef just says, basically, eat, you know, just eat. So they, sat down, they sit down together, and they both start to munch on this hot dog, and they drink this Coke. And uh, they start to talk about it. And the chef asks him how it tastes. And he's like, it's a hot dog. What do you mean, how does it taste? But no, he really wants to know how it tastes. And so he starts to, to deconstruct and parse the, the elements of taste in the hot dog. Because this is a you know, pretty special hot dog that he made there at his diner. And uh, the chef says to him, I could sit you down to a $300 meal and me down to a hot dog and a Coke. Which one of us would have the better meal? Mm. And it's like, it would be me because I know how to taste. I know how to get myself out of the way. I know how to set aside my expectations, my judgments, my mental trappings, my baggage, get out my, my take away my own filters and actually taste, get the, the raw experience of everything that's in that hot dog. I mean, God, if that isn't music, I don't know what is, right? Right. And he, what, he, what he wants the boy to understand is that cooking, great cooking, isn't about wielding a fancy knife. It isn't about clever cuts. It isn't about jazzy combinations. It isn't about the cool things you can do technically, although those things are cool. It's about this raw, immediate, visceral, authentic, honest encounter with the taste of this food and all of its ingredients. And, and, and then that, of course, has its counterpart in, you know, in living. Um, what he really wants the boy to do is to uh, basically go on with the process of living, is, is to get out of this place of, of uh, sort of, what is he going in, retreating into his, into his shell of, of anger and grief and misery caused by the death of, death of his dad and, and embrace life. Which is like, how can you say that to a 14-year-old kid? You can't yeah. just say that. You can't come out and just say, hey, you know, just embrace life. Yeah, thank you. So it's, 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 uh, it's the kind of thing that you have to do gradually uh, if you're a great mentor, is to bring a kid out. So that's, that's my, my very long answer to your very short question. But it was a, it, it was a great answer. I really appreciate it. And, I mean, one of the things that I walked away with the book is um, how the chef helps this young man stop thinking about himself and start yeah. putting other people in front of him uh, and valuing the needs of others first. Yeah, yeah. But the way he does that is through service and through food. And I can't read a book like this and not think about how this applies to music. And so yeah. often we we're all about us, all about me. And yet I want to serve others and music is a communal thing. It's people people enjoy it as a group. Mm. <clears throat> and there's so much parallel between yeah. the idea of preparing food and preparing music and plating a food and how you present a concert. And it's tremendous. You know, I, I mentioned this scene that was the first scene. There's also a, a, a last scene, and it doesn't come late in the book. It's actually in chapter two, I think, but, it, I, but I wrote it very late. The, the first draft was already done, and then this little scene dropped kind of out of the sky into the, when I was sitting there looking at the manuscript saying, what is this book really about? And this speaks exactly to what you're saying. So if you look at the book, on the cover, there's this picture of a little plate of blueberry pancakes and a, and a, a peach rose in a stem in a vase on a plate. And, and it, it, it's an illustration of a story that happens in chapter two where the boy remembers cooking pancakes with his dad, who's dead now, right? But mm -hmm. he remembers, remembers back a couple years back cooking pancakes Saturday morning for his mom in bed, cooking for breakfast in bed with his dad. And his father, who was also a chef, we learn, um, is cooking his famous blueberry pancakes. And, and the boy is like, What's, what makes your pancakes taste so great? Is it the oat flour? Is it the fresh blueberries? Is it the maple syrup? And finally, his father says, the secret ingredient isn't anything in the pancakes. The secret ingredient is who you're cooking them for. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is, the, that is the, the core of the book right there. And I think that's, that's like, that's so music also. I mean, it, it's... The point of music is is that it lands in the ear of the listener, right? Isn't it? It's like yeah. what it what what it creates in in the heart and soul of of the pe of the people that hear it. Um, and so that's 
same thing with the chef. It's the same thing with a business person, honestly. You can create this profitable business, but what's your impact on the world? Who, who, what, what, how are you changing people's lives or how are you affecting their lives? What's your footprint? What's, your, what's, what's the point, you know? Yeah, oh you know, my gosh. When I was a kid, I played cello and I, I played chamber music in, in my, my schooling days in New York City. And what, we had a, uh, an ensemble where we played the, the Brahms F minor uh, piano quintet, one of my favorite pieces. A string quartet and piano, right? Incredibly powerful, passionate piece. Our, I played cello. Our first violinist was, was just come to U.S. from Hungary, and he was this brilliant, pyrotechnically talented kid. He could, like, play anything on the violin. And he was, when, when he played, it was like, you know, listen to a piece of wood. I mean, nothing. You, you, it was amazing. All of his playing was from his head and his fingers, nothing from his heart. And it, it was so challenging for a coach to, to train him how to listen to us and how to express with us and how to, you know, crescendo and decrescendo and do the hairpins and do the everything because the guy was completely in just the technique of it. Mm. And that to me is what this book is all about is, is what was missing in that violinist. Right. It's so much more than the notes on the page as it much is. as it is more than the ingredient that goes into the dish. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The chef has lots of really great lessons that we learn throughout the book, but he has this one that says, pay attention to the little things. When you do, the big things tend to take care of themselves. And that's deeply profound. And I think we can find parallels in so much wisdom literature to that. But how does this idea resonate with you as you apply it in your work? You know, I'll tell you one way it resonates is, is um, <clears throat> I get intimidated by the process of writing. Um, and honestly, this happens every time I've got a new book. And, you know, I've, I've, as I said, I've written about two dozen books. And I, I'm, every time I sit down and it's like, oh, my God, I can't write this book. <laughs> it's very intimidating. What I've discovered is that I can't write a book, but I can write a sentence. It's like um, you can't sit down to to write a great book. Nobody really, really can. I mean, it, it's just it's like trying to eat a mountain. Um, but the 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 what I've learned is to is sort of a passion for the sentence, um, and for the power of the sentence. I'll take a sentence and I'll play with it for you know for half an hour. Um, I think to some of my favorite composers, Bartok and George Crumb, and and having looked looked at their manuscripts or even looked at, at the autographed copies of Beethoven or, or Mozart or what have you and look at the actual way they fuss with individual notes, you know, and look at the way uh, uh, Ravel was such a, a craftsman. He's, someone called him, I think it was meant in a derogatory way, the Swift, Swiss watchmaker of music. <laughs> but man, the way he would put things together, it's it just, uh, the, the, you see the delight in the detail and the beauty of it is, all you can actually write is details. Um, you just have to trust that 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 the big picture is there. You, that that is for me is like an act of sheer faith. It's a leap of trust that the arc of this symphony, that the full scope of this, you know, it's a sonata that comes, that's cyclic. And the beginning comes around at the end, and there's like forty five minutes from from the first bar to the last. I'm going to trust that, and. and all I can do is is uh, is write this bar, you know, this measure, and so uh, yeah, I, it's kind of like I see that I see that so much in uh, in Master Chefs sitting there with Chef Charles is so much fun watching him cook because what I expect is to, to for him to do something dazzling with the knife, right? Right. What I what I see is the way he cooks with his fingers. I mean, he's like putting things in the pan and moving them and the way he's adjusting them. It's almost like, uh, like you know, changing a baby's diapers or something. It's very intimate. It's very personal. And it's very detailed. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, all- that, that, D- John, this has been such a great conversation. And is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that I failed to ask you? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if we touched on this or, or not, but it's it's such a challenging thing for me, uh, the, the thing of, of, of being involved in something that is artistic expression and is also financial. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and, and the way that I see that is, maybe we talked about this before in 118, I don't know. But the way I see it is, for me, every book is two things. It, it's, a, it's a window through which I can reach my hand through and touch other people, right? So it's, it's a book. It's a form of expression. It's also a business. Um, I don't look at my writing career as a business. I actually look at each book as a business. So I've launched oh. 24... I've launched 24 businesses um, or, or 24, 25, whatever the number is. Each of them is a separate business. It's like I, I'm, a, I'm a restaurateur and I've launched 25 lunch counters, let's just say. So every, each one of those I evaluate as, as a writer, as a book, in terms of its impact on people's lives. That's qualitative. And I also evaluate uh, from a business perspective. And what I found is, I will tell you honestly, I think that every one of my two dozen books has been a, has been a success as a book. Every one of them has, I've heard from people whose lives it's touched, it's made a difference. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of all of them. Most of them have been failures as businesses. Sure. And, and, I, and I don't say that apologetically. It's just that, you know, a few have been successful as businesses. And by the way, the way I define success is, that it, it monetarily pays back its investment. You know, usually the publisher pays in advance and buys the book. And, and my time, my six months or nine months or however long it's been to write the book, pays back its investment and then continues to generate an income stream after it's gone to black. That, to me, is a successful business. And I've had a handful that have been successful. A huge, uh, the majority have not. And to me, that adds up to success. Um, because that's kind of like the way it works, you know, even the yeah. ones you love, they don't always, the market doesn't always meet them that way. Um, you just have to have, it, it only takes a few <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to justify, to justify time spent with all the others. I right. Think. <laughs> well, I, I have two thoughts in reaction to this. The first is we can't, we can't hit a thousand. Mm -hmm. The best baseball players right. are, are, I mean, if they hit 35% on base, that's right. tremendous. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I get in these weird movie kicks where we'll pick a, uh, an actor or actress and we'll watch all their films in order. Ah. And like we did that with Tom Hanks and I'm a huge Arnold Schwarzenegger fan. So we did that with yep. Arnold. We yep. did it with Tom Cruise and all the James Bonds. And you see like, okay, about 10% are tremendous. There's another yeah. 10 to 20% that are like, eh, okay. And the rest of them are laughably bad. Isn't that wild? And I remember studying photography in school, and this is in the days of print, rolls of film. <laughs> yeah, actual physical film. Right, yeah. and you, you'd have 36 exposures on a roll, and you'd right. be happy if three of those were uh, worth printing. Beautiful. And we yeah. have this expectation, it's probably true for the written word as much as it is for music, that everything that we put out has to be the best work. Mm. Yeah, that's and fantastic. My other thought in response to what you just said, uh, I want to explore this idea of each uh, book being a separate business because most of us as composers don't do that. But I, what struck me is I had recently attended a meeting of a, uh, a, a, a regional film organization, a lot of independent yeah. filmmakers, and most of these people – uh, form separate LLCs, business entities for each film. And they're doing that for accounting and legal reasons. And yet mm -hmm. it's the same thing because they're thinking of each set of intellectual property, i.e. the film, ah. as a separate entity from it, from themselves and their businesses. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. And really interesting. I try to, I'm balancing that here in my mind as I'm talking with Robert Kiyosaki's lessons about how you really want to work for assets. You don't want to trade time for money. You want to trade time for yep. assets. And yep. you here are trading time for assets. Yes. Is that how you're thinking about it too? Yes, ah, exactly. Exactly. Thank you. It, it's, it's like, I don't use the word property, but each business is like a property. And um, in, in a sense, I mean, if I were Danny Elfman, you know what? My most successful property, my most successful business in this model would probably be the theme to The Simpsons, right? How long does it last? Two oh, minutes? 30 years. Yeah, yeah, but it's been on yeah. the air for 30 Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's like, forget about it, man. Everything else, from Beetlejuice to the Batman movies to everything, doesn't, none of that matters, right? You just got that, <laughs> that mm -hmm. one theme song. Or Tales from the Crypt, that one too. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, but yeah, I, that is exactly how I see them because, you know, here's the thing. I, I, I've been an entrepreneur all my life. I, I've, I have occasionally worked for a, a payroll, but not that hasn't been my main model. But I, I've always sought in my life, in my, my financial life, to find a, a, a business model that would, that would continue to pay me long after the work was done so that A, I could do whatever I, I enjoy doing without worrying about whether it pays me, and B, I don't have to worry about retirement. Mm-hmm. I'm in my 60s now, and, I, and retirement is, is a real, I don't expect to ever retire literally as in I don't do anything anymore. Oh my God, of course not. But I, I, I am trying to build, my, my business plan is I want to build assets, you said it exactly right, I'm going to build assets in the Kiyosaki sense that are like the Go-Giver series is an asset. The Go-Giver was a business, but now the Go-Giver is a series. And you mentioned that at the beginning. I, I'll, I'll say that next spring, we have another Go-Giver book coming out. Do you really? We do. And there, in this one, there is, a, uh, I will, there is a very large dog and a small cat, as well as people. Well, I'll, and, I'll uh, buy the first copy. People are, people are going <laughs> to love it. Yeah, so it's it's this book is part of you know what has now become sort of a, a brand unto itself, which is the Go Giver brand, and that is a that is a property. And I think you could probably, um, you know, it might not work for all composers and all all genres and all all, all spheres, but I could totally see that model being a, a, a cool way to work uh, as a composer because you have different things, different styles and things you do, and some of them are going to land differently out in the world. Well, there's so much we can dig into here, but we just don't have time. So <laughs> hey, hey. when the next Go Giver back comes out in the spring, maybe you and I yeah. can talk again. I would, I would really, I covet that opportunity. Ah, let's do it. Let's do it for sure. All right, let's take a quick break and we'll come back for lightning round. I'm very excited to announce that the Portfolio Composer has become a strategic partner with the American Composers Forum. What this means is that we are working together to Build our composition community. If you have not heard of the American Composers Forum, you can find more at composersforum.org, but it is the largest composer-oriented organization in the United States that has many resources, programs, and grant opportunities designed to help you build your career and to create your art. The biggest benefit I have gotten out of being an ACF member is the curated composer opportunity list. This might be the most extensive list that you can find anywhere with opportunities for calls for scores, grants, and performance opportunities. So I I highly recommend joining this organization. Again, you can learn more at composersforum.org. And I also want to invite you to join the Portfolio Composer community by becoming a Patreon sponsor. By joining the community, you will have access to private webinars that I do for the Patreon communities and students of my course, and as well as private coachings, one-on-one sessions, and a few other bonuses. So please go to patreon.com slash portfolio composer. Welcome to the lightning round. It'll be fun, John, to uh, compare the answers from 118 to this. And I, I did not prepare in advance to double check all of your answers so it'll be a fun exercise to re-listen to both but the first question and here, i am not I am, I am not kidding when i say i have no clue what the questions are so go ahead. <laughs> this is going to be fun then <laughs> what advice would you give to your 20 year old self oh huh, to my 20 year old self i would i would i would say seek out people who know better than you do and listen to them. Oh, yes. Love it. What is a personal habit of yours that you feel leads to your success? I rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. I, I just I have this thing, I just love to get it right. So I will just I, I will refine something until it feels just like mwah, it runs like clockwork. Do you find that you have to turn off this editing voice while you're putting out your first draft? Is that a challenge for you? It is. I think it is the hardest thing, um, or it's close to the hardest thing. The hardest thing is believing I can do it in the first place because I sit down, look at the blank pad of paper, and go, oh, my God. But then turning off the critical faculty, I believe 
I believe that the, the critical faculty is the thing, the inability to turn it off is what smothers most creative expression in the cradle. Mm. Um, I think that one of the greatest skills that a writer, that an accomplished writer has is the ability to just write knowing full well that it's crap or that it's 95% crap, just to put it on the page without any critical faculty at all and then to turn around tomorrow or next week and come back to the same material with a completely different mindset. What is an instrument you have always wanted to learn to play and why? <laughs> God, I wanted to say sack butt for some reason, but that's just not, <laughs> it's totally, totally not true. <laughs> you don't want to be a Baroque trumpeter? Come on, I, why not? I, I don't want to be, a, I don't want to die of an embolism. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess it's funny, the, uh, the oboe, um, huh. I've never played a woodwind, and, and the oboe strikes me as like it would be extremely hard to play, but God, in the hands of a great oboist, such a beautiful sound, such a yeah. beautiful expression. Oh. Hmm. Are, are you familiar with Ennio Morricone's score for The Mission? Uh, I'm not, I mean, I love his music, but I'm not sure I'm familiar with that without you know, hearing it. Well, go back and watch that movie again and then get on Spotify and look yep. up Gabriel's oboe. The, the solo on that might make you just cry. Oh, 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 I know that. I know that. My wife turned me on to that. Gabriel's oboe. Yeah, yeah. I got that. Yes. When my sister was getting married, she wanted mm-hmm. to walk down the aisle to that song. So I arranged it for string quartet and flute. Oh. And it was oh, oh. tremendous. Oh. So here's the same question I asked you. Well, all these are the same, but uh, this is the, 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 the piece of music that has stopped you in your tracks, that's taken your, uh, your breath away for a moment, that makes it feel like time has stopped. But what is one composition that has had a profound impact on you and why? <sighs> and after you answer, I'll tell you what you said last time. All right. It's so funny because three pieces spring to mind, and I bet one of them was it was either you know Bach, Chaconne, and D minor solo violin, or uh, 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 you know what's the name? It's basically, Sibelius uh, Fifth Symphony. Probably one of those. Is what I said last time, but the piece that I think of is Bartok, music for strings, percussion, and celesta. Um, I think he wrote this in Switzerland, maybe when he was getting out of trying to get out, get away from the war. But it's this 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 piece. The first movement is the most amazing piece of musical fabric you feel like you're watching or listening to like the subatomic creation of the universe or something there's something so elemental so fundamental about the music and then you go through these other movements and at the very end of the last movement the freaking thing comes back again in a completely different form and you and it just it never fails to make my entire skin feel like it's going to slip off my body and slither away it's just Unbelievable. Right. So th- you did say the Bach Chacon in D minor last time, <laughs> but you also surprised. said Bartok's string quartets. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. This, this is what, uh, when I was a kid, the, the, uh, my favorite Christmas present ever was the Halsey Stevens biography of Bartok, which I got when I was, I think, 15 or 16 or 14 or something. I still remember opening the present and seeing the writing through the wrapping and knowing what it was. Um, that was that was uh, the first thing I ever heard of Bartok's was the miraculous Mandarin, um, and I heard the on, on the radio one day, and I was just electrified. And then uh, I got into the string quartets, and yeah, I think his string quartets for me are kind of like God, they're almost like the Bible of music. <laughs> well, you can't go wrong, that's for yeah. sure. Yep. Yeah. So this is a new question, one you didn't get asked last time, but. Uh, what piece by a minority or female composer do you feel we should all listen to and know? And this does not have to be concert music. Uh, Hachidan no Shirabi by this composer, contemporary of Bach, I think, whose name I'm currently spacing on, but he was like the, the classical Japanese composer of, uh, uh, of uh, Koto music. And, and again, I believe contemporaneous to Bach, and that has that profoundly affected me. But but that's not fair because that isn't what you asked. A minority or female? Um, <laughs> well, you know what? It's it's non-Western European, and that, hey, hey. <laughs> that's prob- right. that's good enough for today. <laughs> All right. Unless you um, have one that just springs to mind. I don't. But the second thing, the second influence that's not Western for me that has really uh, affected me is is, uh, Indone- is Balinese gamelan music. 
probably every composer in the world says that. But, uh, oh yeah. yeah. But they've got this. They got this myth, you know. They got this legend about gamelan music, which is that they they don't play the music. That the music is already going on in the universe, and what the gamelan orchestra does is just catch it like a radio receiver and make it audible. No. And I I I love that because that's how it. That's how writing feels to me. Sure, I love that. It's a good good analogy. So we will list your book, The Recipe, as a link on the show notes page. I'm also going to link to The Go-Giver. But what is another book you could recommend for the Portfolio Composer podcast listeners to read that could benefit their personal, creative, or business lives? Ooh, okay. Um, Another very short book by Seth Godin, one of my favorite business writers, Mm -hmm. um, Godin, G-O-D-I-N, and he wrote, he's written a ton of books that are, are hugely uh, well-known. But this book of his is called The Dip, D-I-P. Good book. Yeah, and I, I, it's been very influential for me. And I think that for anybody who is in any kind of self-generating career, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful book to absorb and take into your heart. Last question. Where can wow. people find you on the internet? Where can they learn more about the recipe and how can they get a hold of you? So I, I am on Twitter. I am on Facebook, this and that, but I don't, I'm not super active there. I mainly focus all my activity on my website, which is just my name, John David Mann, two N's, dot com. Um, all my books are there, sample chapters, excerpts, buy buttons, reviews, blah, 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 blah. My blog is there, which is kind of my where my work, my workout gym, it's where I, I practice writing little stories. Um, and, and so that's my website. The, the book is there. The recipe is on the website, but also there is a, uh, a devoted site just for the book where we put our, our pre order bonus offer. Um, some cool videos that we, I shot with my, my chef co-author, um, for people who pre-order and that website is the ingredients of greatness.com. Excellent. John, thank you so much for joining me today. I told you this last time, but I am a huge fan of yours and and your books. They have had a profound impact on me personally and on my businesses, and they've helped me Mm. think through what it means to add value to the world and what I can do to make the world a better place. And this new book, The Recipe, is definitely in that mold. I'm a huge fan. I gotta tell you, Garrett. When I discovered that you have this podcast, I was I was blown away. I, I love what you do, and it, as I said at the beginning, it's just so cool for me. So much fun to be in the presence of a whole like circle of composers talking about composition and 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 trying to understand what I do from from that filter. It's really a lot of fun. So thank you so much for having me here. You're welcome. You're well. You can come back anytime you want. <laughs> it's a deal. All yeah. right. All right. <laughs>